a wealthy Saudi Arabian prince. If you could see how these people live, you would be astounded. Charged with executing one of history's most remarkable drug deals. The very fact that he was a Saudi royal, authorities could not touch him. Two witnesses with questionable motives. And this is where our justice system grossly loses its sense of balance. And a woman caught in the middle. Very fine lady. You will never imagine, it, of course, anything like that. Could a Saudi prince be the newest player in the international drug scene? A squad of narcotics police moved quietly through the halls of a nondescript house in noisy le sec a grey industrial suburb just six miles from the centre of Paris. At the arranged time, the police forced their way in. They found almost a ton of cocaine. It was the largest shipment of the drug ever seized on French soil. According to one of the safe house guards, the cocaine had arrived in France two weeks earlier, on a flight from Saudi Arabia. The plane was a royal airliner, a 727 chartered by a Saudi Arabian prince. His name? Naif bin Sultan bin Fawaz al Shala. Prince Naif is a person of, I would say, first magnitude intelligence. He's a deeply religious man. He reads copiously. He stays on top of current events. He's a highly complex person. But was he a drug dealer? The information put the French police in a difficult position. A shipment of cocaine this large demanded investigation. Could a Saudi prince really be responsible for such a bold crime? The Saudi royal family has ancient roots, but very modern wealth and power. Saudi Arabia was, uh, was founded in the early 20th century by King Abdul Aziz uh, with the support of the British Empire uh, to carve out uh, uh, the Arab countries out of, out of the Ottoman Empire. The discovery of oil under the desert made Abdulaziz a major international player and enormously rich. And now it is the, the, one of the largest countries in the Middle East with the largest amount of oil uh, in the globe and with substantial influence uh, politically, culturally and, uh, and religiously. The king took more than a dozen wives and fathered more than 40 sons. Naif Shalan is married to the daughter of the son of King Abdul Aziz, the founder. He is a prince not because he was born one. He is a prince out of marriage. The, the bigger, the larger Al Saud tribe he is in excess of 30,000 people. And every one of them is born with uh, a golden spoon or several golden spoons in his mouth. Saudi princes are famous for the opulence of their lifestyle. Palatial homes, private jets, sprawling holiday homes, and extravagant shopping sprees. And even though Prince Naif is far from the throne, his way of living is just as privileged. Somebody like Naif Shalan. You're talking about tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars. So the amount is beyond belief. Was it possible that protected by this cloak of wealth and power, a Saudi royal had begun dabbling in the international drugs trade? 
A possible answer to that question would begin to emerge four months later and 4,000 miles away in the United States. In October 1999, the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration, or DEA, was concluding a major investigation called Operation Millennium. With the cooperation of the Colombian government, the U.S. was arresting dozens of top-ranking drug traffickers. Helping the DEA was an unusual go-between, a charming and persuasive man of mystery called Baruch Vega. Baruch Vega was an intermediary between the U.S. Justice Department and Colombian drug traffickers. And two drug traffickers that Baruch Vega knew were Carlos Ramon and Juan Gabriel Usuga. Usuga and Ramon were possibly two of the most successful drug traffickers ever to come out of Colombia. Each man was blind in one eye, which was how they got their nickname, the Cyclops Brothers. Baruch Vega, who arranged for Carlos Ramon and Juan Gabriel Usuga to come to the United States and uh, enter into their plea bargains with the Justice Department. The Cyclops brothers were ready to divulge their supposed drug dealing secrets in return for reduced sentences. And there was one deal in particular that Carlos Ramon wanted to talk about, a drug smuggling job in 1999. He says, I was a direct participant in this drug exportation. He says, I was dealing directly with an Arab prince when the merchandise arrived to Paris, part of the merchandise was seized in, in France. For the DEA agents, there was a simple way to check this extraordinary tale, by talking to their counterparts in the French government. The story appeared to be true. The French authorities confirmed a drugs bust in a Paris suburb where almost a ton of cocaine had been seized. In the United States, investigators believed that they could now trace the journey of a major shipment of drugs from Bogota to the outskirts of Paris. And the man behind the deal? Prince Nayef al Shalan. Why on earth would a Saudi prince uh, be involved in, in something like this? The idea of cocaine trafficking is for people to get rich quick. Saudi princes obviously don't need to get rich quick. Um, they have more money than drug traffickers. Not only that, but drug smuggling is punishable by death under Saudi law. It was hard to imagine that for a Saudi prince, the reward was worth the risk. People do these things for different reasons. He seemed someone who just didn't fit into the traditional perspective of, of Miami's drug trafficking environment. As the investigators put together the prince's profile, they found a surprising connection that might explain the prince's involvement. It was an American connection. For over two decades, the married prince, Naif al Shalan had maintained an intimate relationship with an old flame from his student days in Florida. An old flame who had ties to Colombia and the Cyclops brothers. And so, you began to see how it was more plausible, historically, how he could have known her and then maintain a relationship with her over the years and then ultimately had reconnected with her. Her name was Doris Mangeri, and she lived outside Miami. The Drug Enforcement Administration had a new target, apart from the mysterious prince, his lover. By April 2000, agents at the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration believed that they were hot on the trail of a highly unusual drug trafficker, Prince Naif al Shalan, a member of the Saudi royal family. Connecting him to the crime were a pair of Colombian drug runners who had turned themselves in to the authorities. The Cyclops brothers, Juan Usuga, and Carlos Ramon. They were looking to work off a long sentence in a separate drug conspiracy, drug trafficking indictment, unrelated to this. 
The tale spun by the Colombians for the DEA was an extraordinary one. They claimed that the whole deal, where two tons of cocaine was smuggled into France, was masterminded by a mild-mannered Miami estate agent called Doris Mangeri. But the idea of Mangeri engineering an international drug deal seemed incredible. Well, Doris Mangeri was a complete nobody when this case began. Um, she was a, a Colombian-born um, Miami resident, U.S. citizen, um, and, a, and a local realtor. Very polite, extremely well-educated person, a very fine lady. I mean, absolutely. You will never imagine, of course, anything like that. She's a dedicated mother. She's an accomplished businesswoman, a very gentle woman. And she doesn't have a dishonest bone in her body. And yet, the Colombians maintained that Doris was the linchpin of the drug shipment. Miss Mangieri's role in this whole thing almost, seems almost uh, as fantastical as, as Prince Naif's role in this whole thing. But then once you started to see how they had a history together, it didn't shock you as much. Nayef al Shalan had gone to Florida in order to study at the University of Miami. He soon met Doris Mangieri, a single mother with two children. The two began a relationship. During those early years, while Nayef apparently was falling for Ms. Mangieri, he was also falling for the two kids. He would take them everywhere. He would take them to the beach, he would take them boating, he doted upon them. The prince bought Mangieri an apartment and a car. He took her to Switzerland and showed her a bank account with her name on it. Anytime you need money, he said, just get it here. Was Ms. Mangieri in love with Nayef? I have absolutely no doubt about it. None whatsoever. But the charmed Florida life they shared did not last. In 1984, Prince Nayef al Shalan left the United States. As far as the investigators could tell, he never set foot on American soil again. Doris Mangieri moved on with her life. And yet, through thick and thin, Mangieri's connection to the prince remained unbroken. For him to allegedly maintain this relationship for 20 years and apparently stay loyal, this wasn't obviously some casual fling. By 1998, Doris Mangieri was twice divorced with four children. She had settled into the comfortable world of Miami's upper middle class. She was living in what was described as a million dollar house in, in Coral Gables, which is a very old, fashionable suburb of, uh, of Miami. And um, she was living a very good life. Maybe it lacked a certain excitement, I, I don't know. Whatever Doris's reasons, the Colombians alleged that she made overtures to them about a possible drug deal. The Colombians said that Doris contacted them through a go-between. An old friend from her years in Colombia called Ivan Lopez. Ivan Lopez and Doris Mangieri knew each other going back into the 70s. Lopez knew Usuga, and it was through Lopez that Mangieri came to know Usuga and then ultimately Ramon. Mangieri hinted that she could introduce them to a major international investor, a Saudi Arabian prince. They knew that Mangieri was involved with somebody who was uh, a part of the innermost circle of the Saudi royal family. She didn't wear it on her sleeve, but she made it known. So Ms. Mangieri made the arrangements for Azuga to meet Prince Nayef, with whom she'd been romantically linked for years. Usuga and Ramon said that they had jumped at the opportunity. A meeting was planned. And there were different plots they were considering, but the one 
that they eventually adopted was to move the cocaine on the plane that belonged to Prince Nayef. Or at least that's what the Colombians claimed. They said that in September 1998, they met Prince Nayef al Shalan for the first time. They went to Spain's glamorous playground for the rich. Marbella on the Costa del Sol. The initial meeting in Marbella um, is where they had um, uh, talked in, in theory, if you like, about um, the possibility of doing some business. According to the Colombians, the meeting went so well that the group decided to work together. A plan was soon formulated. And they hatched this idea of using the Prince's 727 jet airplane to move cocaine from Colombia through Caracas to um, Saudi Arabia and then to uh, Paris for the purpose of distributing a couple of tons of cocaine in Europe. And that's how this whole thing began. In December 1998, Prince Nayef invited the group to Saudi Arabia for a meeting in the desert and to allegedly discuss the details of the drug deal. Well, supposedly the trip out to the desert was key. The meeting conjured up a scene from the Arabian Nights, complete with air-conditioned Bedouin tents, extravagance and luxury. The meeting in the desert was allegedly where everything, if you like, came together. That they would uh, do this shipment of two tons of cocaine uh, from Colombia via Venezuela uh, using um, the Prince's jet. The Prince's access to a chartered plane was key to the whole operation. There was no way anybody could have ever searched that plane to find that cocaine because he was off limits. And so it was like the perfect smuggling device, you know, to move the cocaine from Colombia to, to Saudi Arabia. He thought because of his status as a prince that would allow him to do whatever he wants and his plane would not be searched and they will never find the drugs. As a test run, the group allegedly decided to fly two metric tons of cocaine, 4,400 pounds, on the Prince's plane. The Colombians could sell a load that size for $36 million. The Prince's share could be as much as 15 million. In fact, this was going to be the first of, of many loads of cocaine using uh, the Prince's royal jet, uh, shipping the drugs to the Middle East and, and eventually into Europe. It was an around-the-world operation, from Venezuela to Saudi Arabia to France, over 10,000 miles in total. In May 1999, the Colombians put their plan into action. Step one, Prince Nayef flew on his private plane to Venezuela, where he attended an oil conference, a seemingly perfect alibi. The next step was to get the cocaine across the border from Colombia into Venezuela and on to the Prince's plane. You know, US authorities were cracking down so hard on Colombians moving their shipments out of Colombia to Venezuela to destinations north. So Juan Usuga came up with a plan. He found a company that shipped truckloads of Colombian potatoes into Venezuela. And he arranged a slight adjustment to one of their loads. And they were able to camouflage the 2,000 kilograms of cocaine under the potatoes since there are hundreds and hundreds of trucks going through the border every day, obviously no one is going to pay attention to another load of potatoes, especially potatoes. According to the Colombians, the truck crossed the border into Venezuela without incident and made its way to a warehouse outside Caracas. There the cocaine was unloaded, 
packed into suitcases and reloaded onto a second truck supplied by the prince. With that small truck, they follow a parade of cars to the plane that we're waiting at the ramp at the Maiketi airport in Caracas. The alleged drug-filled suitcases were then loaded onto the prince's plane. And, you know, the plane supposedly had been upgraded tremendously. There was a space where you could place the cocaine. On the 13th of May, the prince himself boarded the plane. And the jet, allegedly with the drugs on board, flew back to Saudi Arabia. Two days later, the plane left Saudi Arabia, and on the 16th of May, it landed at Le Bourget Airport, outside Paris. The prince disembarked with a large group of his family and went for a visit to Euro Disney. According to Ramon, the drug-laden luggage was not searched or even examined by customs agents in Venezuela or France. The very fact that he was a Saudi royal uh, family member, authorities could not touch him coming in and out of airports, nor could they search his plane. Then, the story goes, accomplices moved the suitcases to the safe house in the Paris suburb of noisy le sec How could he get away with it? He could get away with it very easily because he had diplomatic immunity, and that's how Nayef was able to use his status as a member of the royal family in Saudi Arabia to fly his plane from Venezuela to Saudi Arabia to Europe and move contraband or cocaine, in this instance, on the plane. Two weeks later, the French police received a tip-off and they raided the safe house. Swept up in the initial raid was the chemist hired by the drug traffickers to weigh and measure the cocaine. He knew just enough about the shipment to tell the police that there was a Saudi connection. But by the time the French had identified the plane, it was too late. So the, the plane, if you like, had, had, had come and gone. The French still hoped to locate and interview the passengers of the Prince's plane. They knew the plane was flying to Saudi Arabia. But the Saudi government was less than helpful. The reaction of the Saudi government to uh, Prince Naif Sha'lan's cocaine smuggling was, how can we protect him? And that's what they did. Meanwhile, back in the United States, Doris Mangeri and her friend Ivan Lopez had no idea that Ramon and Usuga were incriminating them to the Drug Enforcement Administration. And this is where perhaps Mangeri and even Prince Naif and Mr. Lopez are so naive. Because any time you do deals with Colombian drug traffickers, you should be ashamed of yourself. Not because you're breaking the law, but because you're so stupid. You never, ever want to do deals with these guys. They will double-cross you. And that's exactly what Ramon and Usuga did. Double-cross their partners and pin the alleged scheme onto Doris, Ivan Lopez, and Prince Nayef. The DEA wanted to speak to the prince about the Cyclops brothers' story, but he was in Saudi Arabia. Any attempts to find and question him led nowhere. So with the prince out of reach, the DEA decided that it was time to close the operation down. They would arrest those suspects that were within their grasp. Ivan Lopez, and Doris Mangeri. On a summer morning, Drug Enforcement Administration, or DEA agents, in assault gear, surrounded a pleasant, affluent house in Coral Gables, Florida. The agents were certain that the owner of the house, Doris Mangeri, was a pivotal player in a drug smuggling operation that had landed the biggest ever shipment of cocaine on French soil. Her collaborator, they believed, was Prince Nayef al-Shalan, 
a member of the Saudi royal family. The prince himself was safe in Saudi Arabia. So the agents would have to settle for Doris. The DEA execution of the search and arrest warrants on Ms. Mangeri's house is the kind of stuff of which cop TV shows are made. Ms. Mangeri was starting her morning. One of the agents made what is called a finger call to her house just to make sure that she was home. Mangeri picked up the phone. Hello? Hello? The caller hung up. The assault team moved closer and closer. Moments after that, a gang of DEA agents went through the door. It was a horror show. The DEA arrested Manjeri. With Manjeri in custody, agents quickly turned their attention to a search of her house. At first, they found nothing. But then, in her bedroom, they discovered a safe. Inside, the agents found exactly what they were looking for. A cache of Doris's numerous passports and a stack of secret photographs from the meeting in the Saudi Arabian desert. Fairly astonishing photographs, pictures of this prince in, in flowing robes uh, in the desert, uh, surrounded by these, um, these other characters in, in the story, um, the, the Colombian drug traffickers uh, and Doris as well. The photographs were a crucial discovery, proof that Asuga and Ramon's story was at least partially true. Doris and the prince had met with them in the desert of Saudi Arabia. And the passports reinforced the DEA's theory that Doris Mangeri was a woman with plenty to hide. Uh, anyone who carries a Colombian passport um, suffers this unfortunate fate of automatically being the subject of suspicion. It's sort of the sort of thing that you can just imagine prosecutors seizing upon. And that's just what they did. With Doris in custody, the DEA tried to get a confession. After Ms. Mangeri was arrested, a brief effort to interrogate her was made by one of the agents who were there. But she declined to talk to anybody, apart from protestations of innocence. Instead, Mangeri asked the prominent Miami criminal lawyer, Douglas Williams, to take her case. My name was given to her family. Uh, I was asked to come see her. Williams visited Manjeri in a Miami prison where she was being held without bail. When I first met Ms. Manjeri in the federal detention center in Miami, the government was saying that no matter what kind of bond she might be able to post, she'd flee and seek safe haven with the Saudis and therefore was a risk of flight. She, and by the way, had no idea of the scope of all of this. I mean, it was kind of like uh, a poison mushroom that continued to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. But the more Williams learned about the case the DEA was building against Mangeri, the more one thing became clear. Doris Mangeri was about to take the rap for one of the largest ever international drug deals. But what about her alleged co-conspirator, Prince Nayef al-Shalan? On the same day that the DEA raided Doris's house, the US Justice Department arrested her friend, Ivan Lopez, and it also formally indicted Prince Nayef al-Shalan. But he was safe at home in Riyadh, and that's where he would stay, because Saudi Arabia has no extradition treaty with the US. And instead of coming to his ex-lover's rescue, Prince Nayef worked on damage limitation for himself. He gave an interview in a family-run newspaper and denied all the allegations against him. He even had an explanation for the evidence against him, 
According to Naev, he wasn't investing with Usuga and Ramon. Instead, they were trying to invest with him in a legitimate Saudi business. One of the several tasks that from time to time had been given to Naev was to attract foreign, which is to say non-Saudi capital, into investments in Saudi Arabia. At the time, the Saudi government was in the process of designing and constructing a very complex design and fabrication process for the production of plastic bottles full of spring water. According to Nayef, he was considering allowing Osuga and Ramon to invest in a water bottle factory. Drugs had nothing to do with it. At one point, Nayef mentioned in passing to Mongeri the fact that he was in the hunt for foreign investors. Mongeri mentioned it to Lopez. Lopez apparently mentioned it to Usuga. Usuga expressed a desire to get involved as an investor in this Saudi petrochemical project. Nayef's alibi was nearly flawless. He admitted to the undeniable facts, the meetings with known drug dealers in Spain and in the desert. But he gave those facts an innocent and plausible explanation. And he said that when he got the first whiff that the Colombians were shady characters, he was the one who pulled out of the deal. With the prince far out of reach, the prosecutors in Miami continued to build a case around the only people in custody, Doris Mangeri and her friend, Ivan Lopez. In March 2005, the federal government put the pair on trial. The court case promised to provide a great story with attention-grabbing characters. Anytime a Saudi prince gets indicted, then, you know, that's obviously kind of a quote-unquote sexy story. The star witnesses would be the Cyclops brothers, Juan Usuga and Carlos Ramon. But would it be enough to get a conviction? Or would the jury decide that it was the Cyclops brothers that had been lying? In March 2005, a remarkable trial began at the federal courthouse in Miami. The case was built around an extraordinary allegation that a Saudi Arabian prince conspiring with two Colombian drug traffickers had used his own chartered aeroplane to fly two tons of cocaine from Venezuela to Paris. It was extraordinary um, for us to see a court case that named a, a Saudi prince, a member of the Saudi royal family, supposedly, um, involved in cocaine trafficking. But the prince himself would not be standing trial, nor would the two drug smugglers. Instead, Doris Mangeri and Ivan Lopez were sitting at the defendant's table. When the case actually went to trial, what we were looking at in court were the two least interesting people. And this was a bit of a show trial. Um, I say show because it had this aspect of being a case where uh, the two defendants never actually produced the cocaine or received the cocaine or distributed the cocaine. So. The U.S. government and the prosecutor's office here were kind of pushing their luck. To strengthen this tenuous connection between the defendants and the crime itself, the government had charged them with conspiracy to possess narcotics with intent to distribute. All you have to prove is that she met with some of the active participants in the cocaine smuggling operation, or made a phone call to one of the participants. It didn't matter that it didn't come into the United States. They carried out the whole thing from US soil, that is Miami. And this was what the prosecution set about doing. Their main source of information was the Cyclops brothers. Carlos Ramon and Juan Greber Lusica both testified in court. And so they gave their accounts of, of what happened. They retold their thrilling international tale. 
starting with the truckload of potatoes in Colombia and finishing with the raid on the French safe house. And they insisted that Doris Mangeri was the person who had put the whole plan in motion. It was a gripping story, and it had to be, because it was more or less the prosecution's whole case. There was no eyewitness testimony, no forensic testimony. No evidence as to how the cocaine got into the alleged possession of Al Shalan. There were no witnesses in court to explain their role in how the potato shipment ended up on Al Shalan's plane. That was all hearsay. That meant that the government's case rested almost entirely on the shoulders of two admitted drug traffickers. Douglas Williams naturally figured that uh, if he was able to put a doubt in the mind of the jury about who these characters were, he could seriously undermine the government's case. So Mangeri's lawyer, Douglas Williams, reminded the jury that Usuga and Ramon were drug dealers testifying against Doris Mangeri in return for lighter prison sentences. They will say anything in order to reduce their own criminal exposure, satisfy their prosecutorial and agent handlers, and do whatever they have to do. Oh, they'll eat their children live if they have to, in order to avoid that kind of thing. People like Usuga and Ramon don't care about anybody but themselves. But perhaps Williams's best defense was Doris herself. I remember she looked uh, very sort of uh, rather defenseless, long flowing hair in a very uh, straightforward trouser suit. Uh, not your typical looking drug trafficker. Doris began by describing her 20 year relationship with Prince Nayef. Then she insisted that her friend Ivan Lopez was the one who set up the meetings between Nayef and the drug smugglers. The meetings occurred, there's no question about it. The question is, did they talk about a drug trafficking deal? And I know the defense lawyers say they didn't. Douglas Williams told the jury that the prince was looking for investors in a water bottle factory, not a drug scheme. And Williams had a clear defense for the so-called incriminating desert photographs seized during the raid on Doris's home. Supposedly that was because she didn't want prospective boyfriends finding photographs of Saudi princes lying around her house and, and wondering who the hell's that. Um, understandable, perhaps. But when the prosecution got their chance, they unleashed some powerful information. They reminded the jury that the prince had actually left the US in 1984 and never returned. The reason? He was a fugitive from the law, even then. He had, in fact, been uh, named in an indictment in Mississippi in the mid-1980s. And it was a drug indictment involving a small plane that flew from Florida to Mississippi with drugs aboard. But one of the only records found from the 1984 case was a copy of an indictment charging Prince Nayef. The detailed reports had disappeared from the state files in Mississippi. I know the defense lawyers tried to find out more about it and, and they ran into the same problem we did. There was no evidence. This murky hint of a drug-related past seemed to give substance to the government's portrait of an unscrupulous royal who believed that he was above the law. Jurors are not dumb. They draw inferences narrative and there are either plausibilities or implausibilities and you can tell circumstantially that a lot of these dots connect after deliberating for eight hours the jury returned its verdict guilty Doris Mangeri was devastated to say that I was surprised and rocked back on my heels by it, as she would be an understatement. Neither of us expected it. In July, the judge sentenced Doris Mangeri to 24 years in prison for her role in the conspiracy. Ivan Lopez, her friend and co-defendant, got 23 years. 
their fellow conspirators, Juan Usuga and Carlos Ramon, had secured extraordinarily light sentences. In exchange for their testimony, the federal authorities slashed the Cyclops brothers' prison terms. Ramon, who procured the cocaine, served less than three years. Usuga, who masterminded the plan, served less than two. Doris Mongeri, on the other hand, wound up sitting in jail for conduct that wasn't criminal. And this is where our justice system sometimes loses, grossly loses, its sense of balance. In 2007, the French government finally put Prince Naïef Al-Shalan on trial in a courtroom north of Paris. I don't know who, if at all, was representing Naïef in the French proceedings. The prince did not attend. Through his lawyers, he explained that he had to remain in Saudi Arabia for what he called vital professional reasons. His caution proved to be well-founded. In spite of his absence, the court found the prince guilty, and the judge gave him a sentence of 10 years. Prince Nayef has not returned to France to serve his sentence. The prince is a fugitive from justice. In a case where you have a fugitive from justice, it doesn't matter who you are, whether you're you know, a man on the street charged in a crime or whether you're the, you know, a prince in a royal family in Saudi Arabia. If you evade justice and you run from justice, you will be charged with evading your crime. And the crime here is, of course, drug conspiracy. The prince was safe in Saudi Arabia, and that's where he would remain, out of reach of the law. But for Doris Mangeri and Ivan Lopez, it was too late. In the end, the, the two people who were bit players in this whole thing, Ms. Mangieri and Mr. Lopez, they end up almost getting 24, 25 years in prison as if they had been bringing tons of cocaine into the United States for years and years and years. But in 2007, critics claimed that this sense of imbalance was restored when a federal appeals court threw out Doris Mangieri's conviction. Ivan Lopez was also cleared. I gotta tell you, you don't see this sort of thing happen very often at all, especially in drug trafficking cases. You rarely see convictions overturned. The ruling of the appeals court was short and clear. Whatever happened on the prince's plane, Mangeri and Lopez were not criminally accountable for it. Their phone calls, meetings and photographs, no matter how suspicious, did not add up to what the law called conspiracy. The problem isn't the facts of the case. The problem is the law. The law didn't fit the misconduct, and the U.S. Attorney's Office made that calculated judgment going in, and it bit him in the butt at the end. The court said, we're ordering the district judge to dismiss the indictment now. Case over. On the 16th of August, 2007, after five years behind bars, Doris Mangieri was set free. The federal government did not appeal the ruling. Although they can't meet on American soil, the prince and Doris Mangieri are probably still in touch. After more than five years, four countries, three Colombians, two lovers, and one international drugs bust, questions still remain. Did a wealthy and religiously devout prince dabble in drug smuggling? And if so, why? US officials have wondered whether perhaps the prince was trying to raise untraceable money for an illicit purpose. Like funding terrorism against Western targets. Using drug proceeds to finance terrorist activity is very common in the modern era. It's been going on for decades and decades and decades. Whether the prince was involved in that kind of activity 
affects anyone's gas. It's a dramatic theory, and many are not convinced by it. It just doesn't wash. It doesn't make it for a variety of reasons. They weren't anti-American. They weren't anti-Western. But there's another theory to justify the prince's involvement. Greed. A prince with $50 million asset, he looks at the other prince with $200 million asset, and he says, well, I should get more. And how do you get more? Let's uh, control the drug uh, smuggling business. Prince Nayef al-Shalan continues to deny all the charges against him. For the governments that wanted to put him behind bars, the prince has proved to be too elusive a target. For now. So there will always be that warrant as a fugitive, and there will always be that indictment hanging over him. And if he decides to go to Europe or come back into the United States and get stopped, he, without question, will be brought to South Florida, to Miami, and he will be tried on these charges.